I'm Chief Architect at Basho Technologies. Have any of you heard of Basho? No. Uh, cool. Uh, we make, if you haven't heard of us, we make the REOC distributed database. Um, and we've been working on that in one form or another since late 2007. Uh, but it was only recently that I sort of started reading some of the distributed systems literature, some of the old distributed systems literature. Of course, I had read some, some relevant stuff, but I had never sort of tried to get a chronological history of, you know, how the, how the field progressed um, and sort of get to some of the fundamental problems of it. Uh, and I'd never really looked at it in, you know, over time. I'm, relatively early on in my career, about 15 years. Uh, so this is sort of a result of me taking a step back and sort of looking at what we're dealing with uh, in terms of distributed systems. I think we get caught up in buzzwords like NoSQL, big data, cloud, uh, scratch away all the hype and what those things all really mean uh, is sort of a move towards distributed systems that I don't think uh, maybe people have realized it, but I don't think it's gotten enough attention yet. And I think calling attention to it opens us up to a lot of resources and a lot of ideas for future work that can make uh, all of our lives easier, both as you know, implementers of these systems, operators, consumers of these systems, uh, and end users of um, the other systems that uh, these kind of distributed systems power. So back in the day, do you remember, you remember these things? Um, the web wasn't used for much. It was all mostly static content. Um, there was no way, uh, maybe except for a few very innovative sites where you could sort of post any data back to the web. It was all read-only, read sort of one direction. And because of that, you know, its utility, it was neat. Everybody was fascinated at the time. I know I was. There was a lot of information on the web. But there wasn't much you could do with it. Uh, this is before e-commerce. This is before social networking. Um, it, was a, it was an innocent time. Uh, so people didn't really care when the, the little digging man came up uh, because, you know, wait a little while and read whatever The thing they were trying to read was probably stupid anyway and not of much value. Certainly wasn't a life or death situation. And, you know, you didn't know if a uh, website was down or if your mother had just picked up the phone and started talking into the modem and caused it to hang up. I might be dating myself a little here with, with talk of modems. Um, Commodore 64 was, uh, was the computer that I came up on. Uh, this is how Yahoo was. It was a static directory curated, you know, there was no such thing as a search engine. There wasn't a lot of uh, distributed systems, for a lack of a better word, but, you know, science going on uh, for the purpose of, of making the web better itself. Um, Another one, that's Microsoft's first uh, homepage. I just put this one up because I thought it was hilarious. Um, yeah. Microsoft's World Wide Web Server. Um, so this wasn't that long ago. This was, you know, 15, maybe 20 years ago, not even 20 years ago. Uh, and it's just amazing how different things are nowadays. Um, and that has consequences. They've gotten different for a number of reasons, and that has consequences for how we build systems, how we operate systems, how we test systems, how we design systems. So yeah, 15 years is a long time. We've come a long, long way since um, the little dicky guy. So the modern web, you know, we have, uh, in the past 15 years, a whole bunch of stuff, of uh, technological advances have happened. Uh, which gives us, you know, new opportunities to make new and interesting applications. Um, and, you know, as those applications make the web more useful and make the web a larger part of our everyday lives, users develop new and, and usually heightened expectations of what uh, those apps are going to provide for you. Um, and because of all this, we have to go about and engineer our systems in, in new ways, design our systems in new ways, and, and sort of think about what exactly it is we're doing you know, the, the craft or the science or the art of, of software, however, software development, however you happen to see yourself, um, uh, it has big implications that I know I didn't, you know, fully realize and I'm still realizing uh, a lot of them. So, what's happened? Most of these graphs just go up and to the right and it represents something good happening, but, and you've probably seen a million of these graphs in various presentations, but uh, this is upstream bandwidth growth. Uh, downstream bandwidth growth has obviously grown tremendously as well. 
but upstream is interesting for some reasons hopefully I can get into um, uh, later on. So about doubles every year upstream bandwidth uh, and if it continues uh, maybe 241 megabits by 2030. Uh, and I think this is going to be something that takes people by surprise, the capabilities that are em emerge when we have this kind of upstream bandwidth. Uh, we were able to get YouTube because our cable modems got faster, but when you can do stuff like this, uh, maybe some of the more esoteric peer-to-peer -peer technology uh, will uh, become, become viable. So another one you've probably all seen, uh, the cost of, of data storage in, I think it was 2000, a dollar got you 10 megabytes nowadays, or whenever this graph ended, a dollar gets you uh, 10 gigabytes. Uh, so we, we all know um, storage is, is very cheap. And smartphone growth. Um, this isn't Mary Meeker's state of the internet. I stopped with the graphs in a second. Um, but the, the orange is, is growth of voice, and the, uh, the blue is growth of data. And so from barely nothing when this graph starts in 2007 to nearly a, an exabyte uh, a month, if I'm not wrong, is, is another driver. Uh, what does that say? It's like 600, 800 petabytes almost. So, um, so a lot of things are changing. So that gives us new, uh, new sort of things we can do. Of course, there's user-generated content. I don't remember when I first started to see user-generated content on the web. It's brought us great things like, you know, YouTube comments and uh, Reddit and 4chan. But this is what the web is really about now. I mean, this is the, the core of, of social networking. Um, but, you know, sites like Yelp, I remember coming out. Craigslist has been around for a while. That's when the web really started to become useful, at least in, in everyday people's lives. Um, so, you know, as much, as much crap as people put on the internet, uh, what you started to see, I would say maybe around um, 2005, is the direction of traffic on the web shifting from just read-only, um, you know, sort of static websites to much more data coming from the user. Uh, where before it was just sort of protocol data, give me this page. Uh, so the dynamics of the web uh, are changing. And if you compare those dynamics, you know, a, uh, a relatively uh, siloed, well not siloed, but read-only database changed by a few people, consumed in a mostly read-only fashion by memory, that's a, by, by users, that sounds a lot like sort of the old ways that relational databases were accessed traditionally. Um, you know, batch updates and then mostly read-only. Uh, the, you know, the, the flow of user-generated content and the, the growth and how interactive the web was started causing data to come the other way and obviously we had to do something with that data and that's when you started to see at least the papers written uh, that w went on to inspire the various NoSQL companies to make their, their databases. It's dealing with uh, this, this new type of traffic, having to store it, having to query it, having to display it, that relational databases weren't uh, designed for. Uh, if you go back, I think it was the Christmas of 2004, this is before Amazon had any NoSQL crazy homegrown databases yet, they were on Oracle, and they had a series of high profile outages that I believe um, were traced back to, you know, in the long run, Oracle not being able to keep up with the, with the demands uh, of you know, an audience of users trying to shop. And that's where we started to see the change in thinking that led to NoSQL today, which is, you know, these traditional values and invariants that databases like Oracle hold, namely, in, in Amazon's case, strict consistency over everything else, including scalability, might not be the best choices for business. It wasn't a technological change. Uh, it's really all about, uh, all about money. Uh, this shift towards uh, more distributed systems. And so that's when you started to see uh, eventually consistent databases come out. Oh, this was more, uh, you know, more things that we can do now. You know, so now we can store all this data. Uh, we have new solutions uh, to store it, um, you know, sort of pioneered by the companies who first had to deal with this sort of user-generated content coming back. We can do crazy things with machine learning. I, I know the uh, guy who worked on that uh, people you may know thing on LinkedIn. You ever tried that and seen how creepy it is? 
how could they know that? So that's, you know, uh, I, I'm often critical of, of the hype around Hadoop and you hear about companies just, you know, we need a big data solution. So they buy 50 machines, put Hadoop on them and just let them sit there so they could check it off. So this, I mean, I think there's a lot of that, but that's a creepily interesting um, application of, you know, what you can do when you can store petabytes and petabytes of data and then, you know, sick thousands of commodity servers at the problem uh, cheaply. And there's a bunch of other things too. We have location-based services now, um, near-field communication, and, and like I said, as you know, these upstream speeds increase, I think there could be some very interesting peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, so we're, you know, dependent on this stuff. Uh, I just got back from London, and I lost my iPhone the first night uh, that I was there. And it was like being naked uh, in a strange city. I depend on it for so much. It's got my, that's how I get a cab. Use Halo Cab and, and, and get a cab from London, yeah. Um, although I thought I was in New York City when I first got there. <laughs> after, I, after I replaced the phone, it works. So. Um, uh, in the States, I use Uber to get a cab. Uh, Google Maps, I'd be, I'd be lost in strange cities without Google Maps, and I expect it there on my phone, and I expect it fast, or else I get in a really bad mood, uh, and, and you know I wouldn't probably go out and explore beautiful places. Um, yeah, and you know, it says something that maybe we're a little too dependent on technology, but this is, this is, this is how it is. So, this is well documented, but I think it's a point that, that isn't driven home enough, and it's really the, one of the reasons why we made REAC is that the higher your latency, uh, you know, high latency rather has an impact on revenue, a direct impact on revenue, and, and people have quantified it. Uh, Marissa Mayer, a couple years back, they did an A-B test where, what was it, uh, added five millis 500 milliseconds to a page, and that was a 30% drop in what would have been ad revenue generating traffic, so a bunch of money. Um, Amazon calculated that uh, if they added 100 milliseconds to the, 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 um, the load time of their front page, they get a 1% drop in sales, and if you've looked at Amazon's results, that's a, that's a ton of money. Uh, and I, there's a paper uh, about high frequency trading and, and the consequences of like your locality to the exchange and how competitors uh, fight with each other to get even feet closer to the computer they're trying to talk to. So for, for high frequency algorithms, they get a, a, a small time advantage. Uh, and one fund calculated that, you know, after you're five milliseconds behind, every millisecond costs uh, four million in revenue per millisecond. Uh, so, you know, latency, uh, high latency, or rather, low latency, and more importantly, predictably low latency, is is really a priority. Uh, going back to Amazon, you've, if you've read about the architecture of their site, uh, it's made of up of something like 170 different services. Uh, and to render that site, I'm sure some of those services can be, you know, uh, fetched in parallel, but others are probably dependent on the result of previous lookup. So. Uh, Variance in your latency in the data stores that back those services that render sites like that is incredibly harmful um, to uh, performance in the long run. So, not only is low latency important, but predictably low latency, predictable low latency is important. And nowadays, again, if you saw uh, Facebook put up the construction guy, if you know you 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 know it would be all over Twitter, or whatever. So yes, users are increasingly impatient. I find myself, and I have to catch myself some time and remind myself of how lucky I am when I'm sitting in San Francisco and Uber cabs not loading uh, quick enough to take me to a place I should probably walk anyway. Um, but we are, we are impatient. And that's again because we've moved stuff that we used to do in an analog sense to, to our phones uh, and to our computers. So, if you are in the business of providing services you'd like people to use obsessively, then you better be focused on you know, delivering a low latency, uh, predictable experience. And that means predictable across hardware upgrades and downtime and, and whatever you know, the world throws at you. So, latency and availability are actually very sort of intertwined. Um, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, latency is latency until the user gives up, at which point the thing might as well be down. 
Uh, and that sort of nuance is fundamental to distributed computing, and it's the reason why distributed computing is frankly such a pain in the ass, is because you can't uh, tell the difference in a bounded time between a node that's behaving, uh, that's just slow, and a node that's down, which makes things like reaching decisions in bounded time, and again, providing low latency answers, difficult. And most of the distributed science research is really about exploring the upper and lower bounds in what you can guarantee, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, that fundamental impossibility proof uh, exists. So what is a distributed system? Everybody probably has their own slightly unique uh, definition. Uh, the one I sort of pulled from Wikipedia uh, says a distributed system is a system of several autonomous computers, each of which with its own memory, that communicate by message passing. Sure, that's uncontroversial and, and, and true enough. I think the decimate definition is probably broader, but I'll, I'll take that one. Um, a more famous one is Leslie Lamport's definition, which is a distributed system is one uh, in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed renders your own computer unusable. So um, this is the task uh, of people developing distributed systems uh, is to minimize dependence, uh, minimize single points of failure uh, among systems like this. So whatever happened to Leslie, you know, you know, might not have had to. So that's sort of the snarky definition. Uh, and one from my coworker and CTO, Justin Sheehy, which I sort of, sort of qualitative one that I enjoy, a distributed system is one which is in a constant state of partial failure. Uh, so things are always failing. You know, gone are the days where we buy a huge big iron from IBM and get a bigger box um, and, and try real hard and spend a lot of money to keep that one machine up. Uh, nowadays we buy whatever costs $10,000, or sorry, $2,000 from Dell, buy a bunch of them, uh, and when they die, sometimes it's even questionable whether you should try to fix them because, you know, who knows if the guy fixing it's going to mess it up. Uh, and it's depreciating anyway, so a lot of uh, Basho customers do what they call rotten the rack, where they just shut it off and keep adding new servers and eventually go back in, in bulk and call the old ones. That's the, the new model of uh, you know, horizontal scale, and, and it's radically different um, than the old one, and it has radical implications on how we have to write these systems. Um, so. We have some new challenges. Given all this change, given all the opportunity, um, what are we, uh, you know, what are we facing here? So you might remember a paper back from 2005 called "The Free Lunch Is Over." Uh, Herb Sutter, big C++ guy, wrote that on what was essentially the dawn of the of the multi-core revolution, uh, and what he was warning about was the sort of exponential step up in complexity that ordinary programmers are going to have to um, conquer in order to make their programs continue to run fast. You know, up until 2005, uh, Moore's Law held on single chips, so single chips you know, would, would continually get faster. It was a dynamic they called uh, Andy Giveth for Andy Grove, the CEO of Intel. Uh, Andy Giveth and Bill taketh away, meaning this chips got faster and Microsoft Word got more bloated, and they had an easy, cheap time doing it because they didn't have to worry about threads and locking and mutexes and race conditions and anything or anything like that, right? Um, but for the most part, single cores stopped getting faster in 2005, and chips got wider, you know, with more cores on the chip instead. So, in order to leverage uh, cores like that, not only do you have to deconstruct your problems in a way that's parallelizable, um, they have to be parallelizable to begin with. But now you introduce the element of coordination uh, and control uh, among uh, you know, things that used to just run along on their own just fine without having to, to ask anybody permission or, or protect a critical section or whatever. Um, variety of things did this. The scope of the problems, um, uh, the, the, thing, the, the decrease in storage price that made storing lots of stuff more efficient the need for latency, the need for geographic distribution and having servers everywhere, uh, and the need for fault tolerance, we sort of got rid of not only, you know, the, the uh, uh, 
like machines running on, or systems running on single machines, but even the idea or the illusion of trying to maintain a single system image of what is actually a distributed system. Um, and from that, and you know, cloud computing was a big part of it too, um, where it becomes easy uh, and uh, you know, to spin up a relatively large amount of relatively low powered machines uh, as an operational expense instead of a cap uh, capital expense. So now we got all that, all this great stuff, YouTube videos and, and all that. Um, but for the example with Halo, uh, they, they deliver cabs and they're in multiple countries and at some point uh, you need to provide a good experience globally and that means having machines in, in multiple data centers. Um, that is, is another huge problem. So you know, you start off with just sequential single threaded code, very easy to reason about, add in um, threads and now you have sort of exponential possibilities of interleavings and you have to control uh, which ones occur so only the valid ones happen. Uh, then we added more computers in it. So you have multiple computers doing this thing over a link that's potentially lossy and has varied char characteristics over time and you can't make the same guarantees about it that you, that you could about your PCI bus or, or your L2 cache. Um, and then, you know, to add insult to injury, as if this wasn't hard enough, uh, now we need to do this all over the world on even lossier links, um, uh, you know, over longer distances with higher latency people. So, you know, again, back in the, in the day, you just drive down the road, no stop signs, go as fast as you want, nobody else uh, to bother you. Uh, if you're watching this, it's very easy to reason about the state. There's a single automobile with a single human inside it going a single speed, uh, taking, you know, a single path. And then you get to the highway where you have, you know, people still driving straight. I don't see many, I don't see any stoplights here. Um, but to reason about this, now you have um, uh, states uh, explosion here, especially when you consider that objects can sort of share state. If you're looking at the driver, if you're flicking off the driver next to you, uh, your state is both flicking him off and his state is receiving the bird. So you have, you know, uh, it gets very complicated. Um, uh, but then when you add other systems and you add public transportation and you add car accidents and the stuff that happens in the real world, um, reasoning about this uh, is, is impossible. And this is an example. You can't just let things go uh, like you would in the single threaded world. This is, you know, obviously a failure of, of some sort of mutex or semaphore, but this is why we have uh, stoplights. You know, it's a mutual exclusion primitive. We have um, consensus. And I think a lot of these distributed algorithms are, are very accessible when you think about them in human terms. Uh, yielding to another uh, driver. We have a protocol in the States, you know, you, you let the guy on the right go. Uh, or the gal on the right, and um, it works. It's a way we achieve consensus, knowing, you know, via an algorithm. Uh, but it's complex and it slows things down, and sometimes the needs for it can be subtle. Uh, you know, somebody pulls over on the side of 101 and it slows down traffic for miles. There's, there's add-on effects, there's emergent effects um, that happen. So, enough of the traffic metaphor, that when you have to think about reasoning about all that stuff um, really is just more than one person can keep in their head. I, I just need an excuse to put this gif on there, I'll admit. <laughs> um, but it's a lot to reason about. Uh, have you, has anyone ever debugged a multi-threaded program? Was it fun? So, yes, one person always says it's fun. Uh, you know, and, it, and you can imagine and probably have experience that a distributed system is, is uh, like that, but, but worse. Um, so, instead, you, you can't just let things run haphazard, even though, uh, you know, that single car on the road can, can cover a lot of ground unencumbered by speed limits or, or stoplights or other people, or the need to talk to other people. Uh, so the tools we tend to have, and they sort of build on each other, and these are really sort of the fundamental um, problems and, and tools in, in distributed systems, coordination, 
consensus and consistency. We use coordination, just a fancy term for machines talking together with the intent on, on, on doing something, uh, to achieve consensus, which is machines uh, agreeing on one thing. And that could be, you know, fire the missile, uh, you know, make sure you only fire one missile. Um, it comes down to a couple problems. A lot of times, uh, like the leader election problem, you want to make sure something happens at least once. Sometimes you want it to happen. Definitely, firing two missiles is fine. Um, or you know, at most once. Um, you know, think of something else uh, disastrous. Um, so. Providing those guarantees actually takes you this circuitous route if you really want to understand the dynamics of it through, uh, you know, sort of these distributed systems concepts. Uh, and then, so, you know, sort of a higher level, of what we use coordination for is to, is to achieve consensus. Um, this is, at least in the context of databases, which is my specialty, the means by which in a distributed database we achieve uh, consistency, um, which is also a valuable property. Um, but uh, the problem is uh, consistency comes the consistency comes at the expense of both latency and availability. Um, you know, if you go back to a human metaphor, the more people uh, if you're trying to make dinner plans, the more people you have to uh, you know invite, the, lo the longer it takes. Um, and you know, if you can't get a quorum of people to go, sometimes you, you cancel it, so it doesn't always work out. So it's not as available or not as easy to do or not as likely to succeed as you just going to dinner by yourself and saying, screw them. Um, so these are really the tools that we have to use. Uh, so coordination uh, is the first one. You know, this is basically just overhead. Um, different distributed algorithms, consensus algorithms in particular, have uh, different message complexity. Paxos, for example, takes two rounds. Um, you need to think about uh, the channels you use for coordination. You need to think about their latency, and you need to sort of do some back of the envelope math about you know what the latency um, impact of each sort of other party you have to talk to is going to be. Um, and so we. Oops, sorry, uh, we have some systems uh, that do this. Zookeeper is one of them, for example. Um, a distributed coordination service, you know, and Zookeeper sits up there with its five machines and, you know, decrees various things that everyone uh, gets to believe to be true, which is a good solution and better than we've uh, ever had before. But as, as I'll get to, um, we don't have a lot of reusable primitives for doing a lot of this fundamental distributed systems work. Uh, so, you know, using coordination, you build consensus. And there's various types. Um, Paxos is sort of the, the algorithm that's most talked about. It also has one of the um, sort of worst histories in, in the literature of, of any other algorithm. Um, uh, about 20 papers called Paxos Made Easy, Paxos Made Easier. Uh, and it's really not easy. I've, I've yet to find one person who can, you know, including computer science PhDs, who can um, sit down and explain it to me. But I mean, the idea is simple. Um, and the way it's usually implemented is you have a, a machine, say five of them, and what you need to do is propose something. And if three of those machines are up and can commit it to um, stable storage, uh, then you've you've you know, achieve consensus. Uh, in the context of databases, again, this is, I propose that the value of this key is this, uh, and then you observe, uh, you know, strong consistency uh, out of a database. Um, Byzantine consensus uh, is a little harder and something you have to implement sometimes, which is, uh, that assumes that all the other processes are friendly and don't try to send you weird messages. Security uh, in distributed systems is often overlooked or left as a uh, you know, something to think about later. But if you have malicious actors that can access your control infrastructure, uh, you just got yourself another round trip and you got yourself a higher um, number of machines you need to provide uh, fault tolerance. Um, and then finally, consistency. Um, You've heard eventual consistency a million times. Dynamo was the eventually consistent database. Dynamo was Amazon's cho choice, business choice, that 
uh, they weren't going to insist on consistency for adding stuff to people's shopping carts. They said it was more valuable to just always allow them to add something, and then at the much more infrequent uh, occurrence that they, that they check out, then you can use a more strongly consistent mechanism. So right there you see the need uh, for varying uh, levels of consistency and databases that can provide uh, you know, a spectrum of these levels uh, are just starting to, to become mature. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our plans um, with REAC as well. You want as little consistency as possible, really, though. Um, computer science is very interested in what's the weakest possible failure detector to solve this problem. Um, you want to choose uh, the bare minimum in terms of consistency needs which translates to coordination traffic, which translates to latency, uh, which translates to the likelihood uh, of downtime and unavailability. It's a uh, sort of snowball effect. So REAC, uh, at least as, as of version 2.0, will have uh, its normal, eventually consistent mode, meaning that as long as one machine is up, it'll accept a write, and as long as uh, one of the machines in your read quorum is up, it'll, it'll serve a read. Um, you can tune it now uh, to the other side where it uses a Paxos-like algorithm uh, to provide strong consistency. So within the same app and within the same database, uh, you can make these choices. And again, they're, they're really business choices. One of my fears is that strong consistency certainly is an easier model to program against. Uh, with eventual consistency, you have to deal with the likelihood of, of conflicts coming back, receiving stale data, uh, deal with resolving conflicts, basically doing your concurrency control on the client side. Um, it's a pain, but it's the price you pay for, for high availability. So just some pro tips here, uh, stuff I've learned over the years, take them or leave them, but my advice, um, understand your consistency needs early, and, and, and less is more. Push to find the, the weakest possible consistency model that you need uh, to serve your data if you want to minimize latency, uh, maximize availability, and ultimately minimize cost as well. Um, too often, and this happens a lot in the literature, and sometimes it's left as an afterthought in open source projects. Modern systems like this, they need to grow and shrink. Uh, dynamic membership is something that is often glossed over, but is often very hard. It's, it's one of the harder problems that there is. And there's really not a lot of literature on it, mainly because they just say, you know, that's left as an exercise or we didn't consider it, it's not in the scope. But for real systems, applied systems, you need to be able to have machines come and go, um, you know, when they die. Uh, systems also have to pay very close attention to versioning of both data and protocols. Uh, in order to support things like zero-time upgrades, you need systems to be able to speak uh, a couple protocols ahead and behind uh, in order to have mixed clusters and not really go down when, when you have to upgrade the software. Um, and all of, this, uh, you know, all of the decisions that you make at the design phase will have an eventual impact on operational expense and testability. And, and this is one thing I've, I've learned, especially at Basho, trying to test some of the more complex code is that you really have to design for testability. Um, you have to, it's sort of a first class uh, uh, thing you need to think about. And I think the, the general gist of service-oriented architecture supports that quite a bit. But um, at all phases, you have to think about testability. When integrating some of our newer, fancier testing stuff, we had to rewrite some parts of the code to make it testable in the way that we needed to. Um, implementation phase, uh, you know, choose languages and practices that enable safe and concurrent programming. Um, Erlang is my choice. Um, it's somewhat esoteric. Sometimes I get JVM envy. Uh, it's a little obscure, but it's been around uh, since before Java. And you know, people often talk about uh, you know its lightweight processes and its actor model, and you know its sort of bulletproof history running Ericsson switches. One thing that is a little more subtle sort of implementation technique um, is it's just philosophy of let it crash. So, you know, when an exception happens in your system, instead of trying to piece the whole world back together inside of an exception handler and continue, the process just disappears and then some process that's hierarchically above it restarts it. That's, that's one, of the most more, one of the most powerful things of Erlang. And I was thinking, you know, why is that? 
And I really think it's because that means that you put your failure recovery code and your initialization code in the same place. Out of any, you know, as you're de developing a system, your initialization code is a code that's run the most often. The code inside the exception handler, this should never happen, log it and throw it, um, or, you know, whatever your attempt was to sort of recover from the exception um, is the code that's the least run. Um, or it's up to you to test it uh, so that it runs. And, do you have a question? Sorry, oh, sure. And, you know, it's code that also changes subtly as other parts of your um, system change. So I, I was just wondering, how did you put program value of functional code um, I use a functional language. Uh, I like, I don't know if it's the functionalness that I, um, I value. Uh, with Erlang specifically, the sort of immutable nature of it, uh, you, you know, no shared memory access processes only communicate through message passing, so you never have sort of a dangling reference to the data. Each process is, or garbage collection happens on a per process basis, so you don't get uh, uh, VM wide pauses, which are, you know, obviously I've been talking about latency, you know, they're harmful for latency, um, and a whole bunch of sort of software engineering features due to its sort of history to, uh, in writing uh, telco switches that drew me to it. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to experiment with stuff. There's a lot of good stuff happening on the JVM too. I think that's going to be a rich uh, thing in the future. There just isn't quite the language yet that I like. Um, the next two kind of go together. Strive to build reusable components. If you wanted to implement Paxos right now, you really have nowhere to go. You couldn't go to GitHub and check out the best Paxos implementation and use it in your software. And there's a couple reasons. One of them is that the, the things on which you're establishing consensus are sometimes deeply embedded in sort of the domain model of your app, <coughs> uh, but oftentimes not. And if you don't want to go install Zookeeper or tell your customers to install Zookeeper, uh, it would really help out to have sort of a reusable uh, consensus implementation. VMS, the old operating system, actually used to have one in their VMS cluster product and then, you know, now, now we don't have one. Uh, there is some promising work out of Stanford called Raft, uh, which was a, it's a consensus protocol where the number one goal of the paper at least was understandability. Because of Paxos' uh, really unfortunate uh, history in terms of how it's been explained, um, uh, Raft does a pretty good job. And they actually quantitatively tested it with students and A, B, the whole thing. And there was a statistically significant uh, better sort of comprehension and ability to explain uh, the protocol afterwards uh, in Raft. So I think that's cool, A, because there's a new consensus protocol on the block, but also the fact that academics are um, recognizing the importance of things like that. We wouldn't need an understandable consensus protocol if people didn't need to understand it in order to write it. Um, and, and in that vein, um, you know, prototype often. And the more reusable components we have, the more we're able to prototype. When um, Fuse came out for Linux, you got a bunch of silly file systems, but you also got a lot of cool ones. And it really lowered the bar to playing with, hey, what can we expose via the file system in Linux? Um, if we had like some of this for some of the um, uh, distributed systems problems, we could prototype more easily and we wouldn't really have to uh, reinvent the wheel as much. Uh, I've been doing distributed system stuff for 15 years and until Basho, where we actually finally built some reusable stuff, at least for us, it's a whole lot of wheel reinvention every time you needed to do something. And again, I'll keep hammering on operational expense. Uh, that's what it really comes down to. Um, that's how we win sales at, at Basho. Um, you have choices in implementation, and some of them are complex, some of them are, um, are, are trivial, or some of them are, are not choices at all, they're forced on you. But focus, again, on, on testability uh, in implementation. It should be a first-class concern. Um, and, you know, if you're designing a command line interface to your software, you know, debug the thing so the guy that uh, has to operate it can uh, operate effectively. These, those kind of costs really, really add up. Um, and for testing, unit tests really just are not enough uh, for this kind of distributed system stuff. Uh, I think that developers have, a, have an ingrained and uncontrollable um, hesitance to breaking their own software. Um, 
uh, that makes unit tests not enough. Not only are they not enough, you know, you just can't generate enough uh, random input to that test to simulate what happens in the real world. Um, you need you need an adversary. It's like a penetration test. It's like a security fuzzer. Um, I won't get into what quick check is. Uh, there's probably a clone for your language, but um, it's a tool that generates a lot of test cases based on a, a specification or assertions about invariance and what your function and what your program is supposed to do. And you just let it run all night, and it tries as hard as it can to break the program. Um, investment in a testing tool like that, although it costs money and takes time. Uh, is probably the one best thing uh, we did at BASHA, or one best improvement we sort of did. Varied workloads. If you write a database, you know, if your test only tests, you know, keys inserted in lexicographical order, or only tests, you know, read-write ratios with a single statistical distribution, those things have crazy interplay with the way virtual memory systems work on various machines, the way file systems work, depending on how you've implemented your database. Uh, invest time in writing your own uh, or if you have to write your own, write your own, but invest time in a, in a testing plan that tests um, as many workloads as possible, um, preferably from traffic samples that you could correlate to, you know, accesses to your database. And again, uh, oh, that's a mistake on the slide. <laughs> um, so finally, uh, I sort of started my career at Akamai Technologies. So operations is sort of the... Um, uh, my favorite part here, and it's what I've been talking about with operational expense the whole time. Uh, myself and Justin, uh, our CTO, started off in the group uh, that was responsible for writing the software to deploy Akamai's network. So at the time, it was like 20,000 machines. Um, and we managed to grow that uh, by a, a factor of two or three without increasing the, um, the size of the team through software. So I guess this DevOps, you know, 15 years ago. Um, so React is definitely written in that spirit, written to be automated. Um, but it's also in, uh, you know, uh, in that spirit in its design. React is a simple uh, sort of homogenous architecture. And it's not just about React. A lot of systems exhibit this architecture. Cassandra has the same architecture. Um, the rest things that the rest roles that you have in a system. If something's the master node and the you know shard node and the whatever node, and you have five different types of things, um, each one of those adds costs to maintenance because you have to monitor them differently. Uh, when someone accidentally kicks one, the recovery procedure for that one is different than the other one. You got to figure out which one it is, and you're likely to to mess up. Um, the potential for human error grows. So simple homogeneous architectures where all the machines are the same. And um, losing one box is no more disastrous than losing another um, are the way to go for, uh, uh, for cheap operations. Uh, beware about emergent properties. And this cycles back to the design, implementation, and testing phase. If you look at an Amazon outage report, it's very rarely ever just a single bug in uh, a piece of software. It's usually some unforeseen interaction between a couple different systems. So, uh, you know, testing's hard enough, but you also have to uh, learn about who your neighbors are systemically you know, in, in your systems and um, at least try uh, to foresee you know, bad things happening between systems that uh, are, are independent or, or separated. Uh, an example of that is uh, TCP in CAST, where this happens in a lot of many-to-one systems, where um, if a lot of machines send uh, responses to a replica at once at roughly the same time and it overflows the switch buffer, then all sorts of flow control kicks in and you can see uh, like a 10 gigabyte pipe only get, you know, one uh, uh, gigabit pipe get only uh, one gigabit utilization. And that's really a pain to find a debug. Um, but the environment that you deploy things in is, is very important to consider in, in all phases of the development cycle. Um, and finally, monitor uh, intelligently. Uh, it's easy to throw up graphs of every single variable but that I'm talking about. The best monitoring system I actually ever interacted with was, again, at Akamai, um, where it was just a SQL interface. And you could do things like select star from DNS servers where uh, select select all processes from DNS servers where the resident size is over 75% of the system memory. Um, and so you don't have to think of things like that at install time or configuration time, uh, and you don't have to express them in some sort of configuration file. It's SQL, everybody can learn it. Managers would write these alerts. So we just wrote SQL statements 
uh, where if they returned rows, they page someone. Um, I've yet to see an open source thing like that. I think it's doable, and if anyone wants to do it uh, as a startup, let me know. Um, and that's it. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, I'd love to talk about this stuff. Basho is uh, always hiring. I'm RV0 on Twitter. Uh, and there's a copy of this presentation. All that futzing in the beginning was me deciding I needed to do a uh, HTML5-based presentation. So no distributedworld.herokuapp.com. Um, you can get these slides. Uh, and I think I'm out of time, but I don't see anybody waiting. So if there's any questions, I'd love to answer them. Come on. Could you explain Paxos? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the, the most, to be honest, the most I can explain it is, you know, you have machines and you have quorums that overlap and you have stable storage and it's magic and it's hard. Yeah, no, I really can't. I could do a better job of explaining Raft, but maybe not right now. Anyone else? Alrighty, well, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, again, check out our stuff. We make React, uh, the database, and the React Cloud Storage product. It's uh, basically an S3 clone implemented on top of React. Um, and all that stuff's on either our website, basha.com, or uh, github slash basha. Thanks.